Hi everyone, if you're watching, I'm sorry, I'm just getting us set up. Um, I'll have to go share my screen right here. So right here is the presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty, everyone. So um, we are going to get started. We're one minute behind. Sorry about that. Um, I will just present here and we get started. All right. So hi everyone, thank you very much um, for joining us. We are so happy to have you here. Um, today we are going to be um, on to the next um, series of the webinar for anxiety. Um, today, Danielle and I are going to focus on understanding the relationship between trauma and anxiety in K through eight children. Um, so basically our presentation is gonna be all about um, how anxiety can stem from trauma or a traumatic event. Um, that a student has experienced and how it can manifest inside the classroom. So again, um, I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Maggie Schmidt. I am one of the kindergarten intervention specialists at JB Lindhurst. Um, this is my fifth year here at JB, and I'm also working on my master's in clinical mental health counseling um, from John Carroll University. So I'll give it over to Danielle. Um, hi, my name is Danielle Manzeo. I'm one of the third grade intervention specialists at the Lenhurst campus. Um, this is my third year at JB, and I'm excited that we are able to present some information and hopefully you guys are able to take some of it with you and apply some tools you learn at home. So to start off, what does trauma look like to a young child? Um, it's important to understand what trauma is. So trauma can include many different things. Um, some big ones would be death of a family member or a close relative or friend, um, divorce of parents, um, the loss of a close member of your family, or again, a good friend, um, divorce, illness, um, those big events that cause huge reactions and emotion. Um, it's important to remember that sometimes what is traumatic for an adult may not be traumatic for a child and vice versa. So sometimes um, something like the death of a pet um, at, in an adult that has a stable, um, you know, emotional regulation, they might grieve in a typical manner. You know, you might be sad for a few days, a few weeks, and you might be able to start to move on after a month or so. Um, and a, a child might be very different. That might be something that it might take months and months and without the right tools and without the right strategies to handle those big emotions, it could linger a lot longer. So again, it's important to recognize that you know, what trauma is to you might not be what trauma is to a child. Um, again, these feelings can last for a really long time if not given the right tools to cope with them. And it, it can generate some anxious feelings in the classroom. It can generate anxious feelings at home. Um, and some of these feelings in the classroom might look like off task behavior. Um, a child might be a little bit more quiet or reserved than they were in the past. They might be easily distracted or overwhelmed. Um, forgetful, they might demonstrate some new behaviors that they hadn't prior to the trauma, such as like avoidance or escape behaviors. Um, they might be angry, loud, upset. Um, again, those really big reactions to small little problems. They might be a little bit more short tempered or um, disrespectful. So it's important to look for those things and changes of behavior. Again, these are things that the child did not demonstrate prior to the trauma, but that are new to them. Um, and that's you want to look for those as soon as possible. Um, but again, it can look different for every child. So it's important to just recognize big changes. All right, technical difficulties were not, oh, there we go. All right, so um, next, understanding the um, relationship between trauma and anxiety. Um, so Danielle talked about a little bit about what um, that anxiety can look like after a traumatic event. Um, but I think the most important thing to remember is that it's going to look different for each child. Um, so because it looks so different for every child and um, every child is um, has their individual um, reactions to a problem, um, there are definitely different coping strategies that, um, that children can handle in order for children to handle their thoughts and emotions in a healthy way. 
Um, two of the examples that we use often at Julie Billiard School um, are the kick plan and then a calm down kit are two um, of the most frequent examples that we use. So the kick plan um, is, it stands for, um, it basically identifies negative thoughts before they continue to escalate in the child um, in the classroom. So K would stand for first just knowing that I'm nervous. So recognizing that they're feeling anxious or nervous um, or worried or other sort of negative emotions. So just recognizing that that emotion is there. The I would stand for icky thoughts. Um, so identifying the negative thought that they're having um, and that may be causing their feelings that are that are manifesting for them. Um, the C would stand for the calm thoughts. So identifying an alternative thought that's more realistic or more positive. So um, maybe suggesting that they um, suggesting that they use positive affirmations to calm down or um, suggesting that they um, can show some other positive emotion instead of um, this icky thought that they're having. And last would be to keep practicing. So practice identifying negative thoughts and finding the alternatives to, um, to the thoughts that, that are manifesting in, those class, in the classroom. And oftentimes that's just a way for students to um, pinpoint what these thoughts are and how to replace them with a more positive thought or behavior. Um, another example would be a calm down kit. Here we have an example or a picture of what a calm down kit could look like. So just super small and usually on just a ring um, where they can keep in their desk or in their pocket um, or somewhere close to them so they can have easy access to it in a, um, in a way that doesn't draw too much attention from their peers. So again, a calm down kit can look a bit different for every student, but it can include various strategies um, to remind the student how they can calm down or what works best for them. So those can include um, take a drink to the water fountain or count to 10 forwards or backwards or um, do some belly breathing or um, find a fidget that might help to get that nervous energy out of their hands. Um, so the calm down kit can look different for every student based on what their, um, what their preferences are for their strategies. Um, next, it's important to remember that trick events Danielle. I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, awesome. Sorry. The whole time we haven't been able to hear each other. So this has been um, a little a little bit with some technical difficulties. Now I can now we're good. So I hope everybody can has been able to hear us this whole time too. I think Maggie, if you want to go back, I think I wanna you might want to start like halfway through that slide again. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> This one? Yes. Okay, did it, did it, nobody heard me? I think I lost you around the traumatic events caused students have extreme emotions. The okay, cool. So 
We'll just start. Um, we'll, we'll just start here. Demonstrating flexibility, which we use all throughout the day. Also, exactly. We're always demonstrating the flexibility here at here at JV. So, um, so we'll just start here. So it's important to remember that behavior. Um, due to anxiety or trauma is very different than other functions of behavior. So um, there are five functions, or there are four functions of behavior that are important to point out. Um, attention seeking, escape, sensory, or self-stimulatory and tangible. Um, but behavior due to anxiety is very different than that because the oftentimes the traumatic event or um, some sort of trauma is what is stemming this anxiety. So um, that's an important thing to note as, um, as you're considering where the same anxiety is coming from in, in your child. Um, and then it's also important to note that students may act differently at school compared to when they're at home. So when they're at school, they might um, demonstrate very positive behaviors, wanting to um, show those expected behaviors as, as um, with using the language that we use here at JB. Um, however, at home, it might not look exactly the same. So while it's important for parents and teachers to always be communicating those um, behaviors to each other so that everybody's on the same page, um, it's important to note that um, they might not look the exact same in the school and home environments just because um, of the very, very different situations that, they're, that a child can be in. So when specifically talking about the classroom environment, there's a lot of interventions that we use daily. Um, a lot of these can be applied at home, um, but specifically it's really important to try when you're thinking about the peak behavior. So when you're thinking about like the explosion or like if you're talking about like on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling? Five being the most mad, you're talking about that five. So you wanna avoid trying to implement strategies at that moment because when a child is really heightened and when a child is really frustrated, they're not really in a state to, um, to talk about their emotions. They're not really in a state to think rationally. So you wanna try and look for those antecedent behaviors that lead up to those big explosions. So maybe fists are clenched, heads down, face might be getting red. You might see them gripping something really tight. Um, you wanna look for those behaviors to try and implement um, the strategies then. So some of these strategies um, would be like we spoke about earlier, taking deep breaths, um, going to take some jumps, taking a walk, grabbing water, um, using your calm down kit that's specific for that child. So maybe there's a, a certain fidget that that child likes, or maybe they have an expandable ball that visualizes the deep breaths. Um, maybe it's a positive affirmation. I know a lot of students, when they're frustrated, they have a lot of negative thoughts and you want to have those cards like, what are you good at? I know I'm good at this. I know I can do that. This might be hard now, but it's something that I'm learning. And just those positive thoughts. Um, so all those can be in their little, their little calm down kit. Um, it's important to teach these calming strategies before needing to use them. So as a class, we take 10 deep breaths all the time. We take turns taking jumps on the trampoline. We um, learn how to use fidgets appropriately so they're not being distracting. So you wanna teach um, using the strategies before they need to be implemented. You don't wanna be presenting a student with a brand new item and they have no idea what to do with it and that's just causing more frustration, more anxiety. Um, you wanna teach them all the time. So we do have little visuals throughout the classroom. Um, in the picture up here, you can see um, the first card says, I need a break, I need to take jumps, I need a mask break. Um, which is new this year. Hopefully we don't have that one much longer, um, but you want to teach them throughout the day. So, hey, you're doing a great job sitting and doing your work. Why don't you go take 10 jumps and then come on back? Um, or, you know, let's everyone as a class, let's take 10 deep breaths. And I know, you know, we do the star breaths and we can um, outline your finger. Um, lots of different strategies to teach big breaths, the expandable ball. Um, but you want to do those often throughout the day, not just when you're seeing heightened behavior. Um, it's important to recognize and label behaviors. So as much as we want to, um, you know, it's easy to call out negative behaviors, but really you want to catch the positive as often as you can. So, hey, I love how you worked through that by yourself. Like, great job. Or I love how you asked for help when you were frustrated. Awesome. And Or you can also say, hey, I see that you're getting a little bit frustrated. Your fists are clenched. Your head is down. Let's try some strategies to help us get back on track. So you want to label both positive and negative behavior, labeling the positive way more than the negative. Um, as a child becomes more independent in asking for a break or utilizing those strategies, you want to fade back the prompts. So instead of saying, hey, I see you're getting frustrated, let's try and use one of your strategies, kind of wait it out a little bit and see what they do on their own. 
Um, a lot of times you'll see kids pull out their break cards in the very beginning, they might go through all of them and nothing's working, but you can re reinforce that you really liked how they thought to use their cards and maybe one didn't work today, but let's try this one again tomorrow and work them through it. But you wanna, again, label those behaviors and call out the positive behaviors as often as you can. And as they become more independent, you fade back and then you reinforce um, as you see fit. Um, it's also important to reinforce um, in the moment very quietly. So maybe like the nonverbal praise by giving like a thumbs up or just acknowledging that you notice that they did something independently and that they're doing a really good job at it. But then afterwards, when they're completely over the incident or when you're able to talk about it without getting frustrated again, really talk, really like talk it up and, you know, show them that you are so proud of them. That was a really hard thing that they did, even if it was something small, because in the moment that was very challenging. So it's important to reinforce um, their, um, their effort and their independence. It's important also to stay, stay calm and to listen to the children. Um, I know oftentimes when the kids are frustrated, it's really easy to get frustrated yourself, especially in my mind, it might be such a little problem, but to them again, they might have those big reactions to little problems due to something that's going on in their home life or something that's happened. Um, so it's important not to judge or to place blame on them. And it is just a time to listen. Um, even if their thoughts seem irrational, that's not the time to go back and forth with what's right and what's wrong, because in their mind at that moment, it is a very real problem. Um, so the give, give the students time and freedom to use their strategies in a safe and productive way. Um, you know, if something isn't working, that's okay. It might not work today. Let's try it again tomorrow. So talking through what you're doing and explaining, um, verbalizing the behaviors is really important. You'll see in the bottom picture, um, it's a calm down area. So you'll see the little um, stuffed pillows on the rug. You'll see the drawers that are full of fidgets and the expandable balls. You'll see like the noise canceling headphones. Um, this is a little area for kids when they're feeling overwhelmed to kind of just go and cool down and take a break. Um, so that's in the kindergarten classroom, but there's different zones throughout the school that kids can utilize. Yeah, and just um, again, Danielle mentioned that this is um, in the kindergarten classroom and um, a big part of the first couple weeks of, of our of the school year is teaching them how to use this appropriately. Um, so oftentimes we'll like Danielle mentioned, um, we will find times when they're completely calm and and say, oh, I love that you're calm and point those things out, but then also teach them while they're calm how to go use the down, the down zone appropriately, how to choose the appropriate fidget that's not going to be too distracting to their learning. Um, so that's a really important part of the beginning of the school year um, is teaching them how to use these, um, these tools the right way so that they don't become um, too much of a distraction or um, just something that they want to go do just because. All right, so um, we've already talked about many of these just throughout the previous slides, but um, next we're just gonna kind of talk a little bit about the specific interventions that we put into place in the classroom every day um, at different times of the day. So um, if you do start to notice those antecedent behaviors, um, antecedent behaviors are those um, little things that you may notice before a big behavior occurs. So um, this could be in the form of like a clenched fist or heavy breathing or face starts to turn red or um, you know that a student has often gets upset after losing this one specific game or if they didn't get the turn that they really wanted. Um, so those are the antecedent behaviors, little little clues that you can get that that might lead to a bigger um, meltdown or a blow up uh, from a student. Um, so oftentimes these, times these are a pattern. Um, so it's important to notice those patterns um, and try and catch them before, before that meltdown or blow up occurs. Um, so in order to kind of catch those in the moment, um, we have lots of different strategies um, or prompts to be used within the classroom. Um, I won't read all of these, but um, a few of these can include, again, like we mentioned, the breaks are really big for our students, um, having a calm down kit, um, Fidget toys, like here, these rainbow fidget toys on the screen um, are a lot of what we use. Again, not very distracting, easy just to hold in your hands and um, and not make the other students around them distracted or not looking at the lesson. Um, for the older students, this may look like a stress ball in the hand. Um, oftentimes, uh, social stories are very important. So talking through them, um, okay, I've, I lost this game, I've lost before, it's okay, this is gonna make me, um, make my friends wanna continue to play the game with me if I stay calm. Um, I'll want, I'll get to play again if I stay calm and 
um, kind of just walking them through the steps to staying calm in that moment um, rather than having, having a big reaction. Um, also flexible seating is very important. So giving a wobble chair, if you notice a student might need to be moving around um, or a standing desk if a student need, likes to move their feet a lot while they're learning, um, making those available to students as well as is important. And lastly, we um, use the Michelle Garcia winner social thinking curriculum um, quite often here at JV as well. So we use a lot of her language um, such as big problem or a little problem. Um, so is, is it a super big problem? Um, kind of like these um, charts that we have over to the side, these visuals, like how big is my problem? If it's a big problem or it might be labeled as a five or an emergency, like a fire or somebody broke a limb or somebody's nose is bleeding. Those are really big problems that need to be solved immediately and really only have one solution, such as like go to the nurse, call the ambulance, call the fire station. Um, and then a little problem might be labeled something um, as more of like a zero or a one. So um, I lost a game or I was the last one um, to line up or I was um, I got a couple answers wrong on my math test. Those are problems that have a lot of solutions to them. So um, I got some problems wrong on my math test. I can do some extra practice during my study hall or um, I lost the game. Oh, that's all right. I can try again next time. Um, so those are things that have lots of different solutions to them. Um, she also uses the Superflex characters often. Here we have a, a picture of um, Superflex on here. Um, we talk about Superflex being somebody who can overcome um, those little things, those little um, unthinkables that might come throughout the day. So um, if Rock Brain comes along, Rock Brain really likes to feel stuck on one certain topic. Um, Superflex can overcome it or um, was funny once is another unthinkable character that we refer to is this child keeps saying the same joke over and over again and that's starting to frustrate or annoy their other classmates. Um, Superflex can overcome it. We can move on and find something else that's funny or find something else to talk about. Um, and then the another two words that we use quite often are unexpected and unexpected. Um, so really praising students like Danielle mentioned for when they are using the strategies strategies appropriately and say, that's a really expected choice. I'm really proud of you. Um, but then also um, noting when they're making more unexpected choices. Um, so that's an unexpected choice. We don't wanna um, be doing that right now. Um, and then the last little visual that we have on our um, right here is the today I feel, um, the today I feel chart. So. Occasionally, we'll we'll pull this out, and the students will each have their own little clothes pin, and they'll get to choose um, how they're feeling that day, and explain if they want to use their words to explain why they're feeling that way. Um, if they don't want to use their words, they can just simply move their clip, and sometimes it just kind of eases the anxiety and and labels that emotion that they're feeling. So uh, the population of a lot of our kiddos at JB, um, we have a lot of kids that have difficulty regulating emotion, um, a lot of kids that have trouble navigating certain social skills. So we already have um, kids that this is a little bit more difficult than it would be for a typically developing child. So um, Maggie and I both saw a need in our classroom and in our school for a safe place for kids to um, talk about things in their life that maybe not as many children can relate to. Um, so after doing some research, um, I found this program called Rainbows, and um, we, Maggie and I both um, did the accreditation and we got certified um, to be Rainbows instructors. Um, so after going through the curriculum and the training, we found that there's even more of a need than what we just recognized within our classroom. So these are just some statistics that we found are that Rainbows, um, I guess, showed us. One in 40 children will experience at least one parent being deployed. Seven out of 10 teachers re report having at least one grieving student currently in their classroom. Um, more than 50 million children in the United States have experienced at least one potential traumatic event and more than half have encountered multiple incidents. One in four children will experience their parent separation or divorce and one in 15 children will experience the death of a parent, guardian or sibling. So as much as these statistics are really sad and overwhelming and maybe to see it on paper, it's even more of a shock than what you would think um, in your classroom, but it's also important for parents to recognize if your child is one of these 
statistics that they're not alone in the classroom and that chances are there is another child that's experiencing something really similar or something that they can at least relate to. Um, so I know Maggie and I both are part of these statistics in some way, um, which I think helps um, hit a little bit more like closer to home. I know like growing up, I didn't think that anyone experienced something that I had gone through. And now looking back, I know more and more people had, and I wish at the time I would have known about it. So I would have had someone to talk to and someone to kind of just share similar experiences that were going on. So um, after doing the um, certification, we started a group. So Maggie, if you wanna go into the group. <laughs> Yes, so um, as Danielle mentioned, um, we definitely just saw such a need for a group like this at JB and we're so happy that we were able to um, bring it here. But at the top, um, it just shows our kind of what Rainbows for All Children is about. So it's dedicated to providing support for all youth as they um, navigate grief and heal from loss, whether that's death, divorce or separation, deployment, deportation, incarceration or other traumas. Um, so. Again, not all the students in the groups um, are dealing with the same loss or event. Um, however, one thing that does bring them together is that they're all going through something and something different. And so, um, as Danielle mentioned, it's a really great way um, for them to recognize that they're not alone and they have other people in school that they can connect with um, in some certain way. So um, we've split up the, the groups um, within in three different sections. So rainbow, rainbow is level one, level two, and level three. Um, and that's really helpful just because all of the students are at very different developmental levels. So um, with the younger groups, we focus um, very much on labeling those emotions as we've talked a lot about throughout this presentation. Um, we, again, as we mentioned too, support leads to healing. So um, these younger groups focus on um, supporting each other and uh, labeling the emotions and lab and supporting how each other is feeling at, at every moment, whether it's those happy feelings, the sad feelings, um, the angry feelings or feeling worried. Um, our, our biggest goal for them is really just getting them to talk about how they're feeling um, and how they've felt within various life events that they have go gone through and how they are going and what they are going through. Um, the older groups, we um, dig a little deeper into these feelings and emotions and how they affect their life um, and what is and isn't in their control. So the older students, while they're already pretty much have mastered um, labeling those emotions, it's kind of just getting one step deeper. It's um, a very safe place for them um, to reflect on situations that have happened in their life um, and express um, express how, how that how that's made them feel and, and how that they have control or, or don't have control over those certain events. Um, so within the various groups, um, we meet twice a week um, and it's after school hours. It's for about 45 minutes. Um, the way the groups are set up is the first five minutes, we always um, sit just together as a group. We all have a healthy snack. We um, just talk about what how our day has been going and um, and we always start by saying, let's share one bum and one brag. Um, a bum being what was one bummer that you had today and a brag being what was one thing you wanna brag about or one, one really awesome thing that happened today that you'd like to share with the group. Um, and that's just a really great way to kind of break the ice, get everyone comfortable and get everybody um, just talking. And sometimes those five minute beginning discussions um, end up taking the first 25 minutes, depending on what one or two students are going through and, and what they wanna talk about. It's, um, we try and make it as student-led as possible. Um, and then after those, the kind of beginning bum and brag um, times, we move into what our topic is for the week. So here you can see all of our different topics um, that we focus on, um, self and feelings, divorce, death and loss, um, and so on. So we try and at least make it where um, at least one week is very focused on something that one of the students or multiple students have gone through or is going through so that they can learn about each other's journeys and, um, and connect with each other in that way. So these are some takeaways. Again, this was through the Rainbows curriculum and through the training that Maggie and I attended. Um, these will be attached in a PDF that gets sent to everyone along with the email recording of this. But um, just some tips that we thought that were, even though in the back of your mind, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, or yeah, I knew that, like that makes sense. In the moment, sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to remember. 
So it's really important um, to, when you're helping someone that's grieving to remember to be an active listener. Again, that you're not judging them, you're not placing blame, um, you're just solely listening and to make sure that you're aware of your nonverbal body language because a lot of times, you know, you could be listening, but you might actually be thinking about something different, or maybe your facial expression shows that you're kind of frustrated or annoyed, even though you're not saying it. Kids pick up on these things, and also they learn from these things. So it's important that you're being an active listener, so acknowledging what they're saying. And um, again, leading into the second one, um, don't just sympathize, make sure you're empathizing with them. These are really big emotions, and this might be a little problem to you, but in their mind right now, it's a really, really big deal. And it's important that you um, feel what they're feeling or at least try to experience what they're, where they're coming from. Um, number three is to show compassion. Um, let the person feel their emotions and show no judgment. So again, just be compassionate. Um, acknowledge their grief, don't try and fix it. Um, as again, some strategies might work one time. So by saying, go take, you know, let's go take 10 deep breaths. Like that worked last time. It might not work this time and that's okay. So you're not here to fix the problem. You're just here to help them work through it. Avoid looking on the bright side. Um, I thought this was kind of funny when I read this. Don't use the phrase at least, or like it could be worse because in a child's mind, like this is worse. This is the worst it gets. And there's not really much that they can think of at the moment that is worse. So acknowledge that you're right. This is a really big deal. And I, I see why you're frustrated. Um, so show, show support. Um, this could be even older students, like we're maybe, you know, taking 10 jumps on the trampoline isn't something that they see appropriate but show support by maybe a phone call away. Like if you have an older child, maybe like in high school and you knew that the morning was a little bit of a rough day, check in with them, text them. Hey, how's your day going? Um, you know, I hope, I hope, you know, something positive happened today or I hope that your, you know, your day is turned around. So just be there um, to support them no matter what their age is. And I know sometimes it's a little more difficult too with older kids because you don't want to, you know, be that parent that's like always, you know, how, how are you? Are you okay? What can I do to help? Because that's frustrating and that could also lead to um, more frustration, which is not the goal of this. Um, last, sit with a person and provide comfort. Sometimes just sitting in silence is something that helps kids. So nothing is too little. Um, it's good to try everything um, and see what works. Sometimes it even helps to take notes. Um, you know, when this happened, this was successful in helping. When this situation happened, this did not work, but this did. So just take notes. Um, and then last, I also thought this was interesting, um, how to accept help when you're the one that's grieving. I think oftentimes as teachers or as parents, you feel with your child. So when your child comes home from school and they had a really tough day, you also kind of take on that burden and you might feel um, you know, a little bit sad or a little bit um, frustrated yourself. So it's important that you recognize your own behaviors and your own grievances are different than your child. So make sure that you're working on your own behavior so then you can then be helpful to your child. But if you are the adult or if you are the person that is um, helping the child, make sure that as an adult, you realize that you're not a burden to your friends either. So basically practice what you preach, which is a lot more um, difficult than it sounds, but um, to take your friends up on the offers. And if you know a friend's like, hey, let me know what I can do to help. It might be, you know, you might be scared to reach out, but it can be mutually beneficial. Sometimes when people want to help, they feel comforted knowing that they're able to help you. So remember that you're not a burden and to seek that help and accept it. Um, understand that grief is a process and that it takes time. Um, I know that a lot of times, you know, it's really frustrating to have to like go through the process. And sometimes the process is really hard and it might bring back some old, some old emotions and it might resurface some things that you felt in the past, but it's important that you go through those steps to be able to heal and to be able to, you know, be successful at the end and be your best self, which when you're your best self, you're able to help your child the best. Um, feel vulnerable, which I think is really difficult um, as an adult too, like when you're sad, your child knows, you're, you know, the students recognize when you're sad or frustrated and it's okay to say like, I'm really feeling sad right now, I'm gonna go listen to music or I'm gonna go read a book and then we can talk in 10 minutes. Or I'm really frustrated right now, I'm gonna go take a jog and then I'll be back and we can talk after. So it's okay to label your own emotions and to feel vulnerable, even with your child, who might be going through something similar, because if you're not feeling your best, you're not gonna be able to help your child. Um, accepting help doesn't show weakness, and then to practice self-care. So again, the repetition, the practice, um, take time for yourself, and that's an important um, part of this whole healing process. But again, these will be attached um, in PDFs once the recording gets sent out to everyone, so you guys can have these um, to look at.
All right. So um, I do see that some um, questions have gone through. So I appreciate those have who have um, asked some questions. Um, Danielle, did you want to sure. ask some of them first? Yes. Yeah, so one is, is this at both campuses? I'm assuming that's the Rainbows program. And this is our first year with it at um, the Lynnhurst campus. In the future, we definitely hope to expand now that we've kind of worked through some of the kinks and we've kind of gotten more comfortable with the curriculum. I do think in the future, this would be something that would definitely um, be able to expand and all campuses would be able to utilize. But as of right now, it is just at the Lynnhurst campus. Awesome. Um, and I appreciate those who mentioned that we had a lot of sound issues at the beginning. I'm very <laughs> sorry about that. Um, all of these slides will be sent out um, to everybody at, after the um, our session is over. And um, so a recording of this and the slides will be sent out. Um, I'm again, apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I see another question, um, explain the difference between trauma and anxiety. So when we refer to trauma, we're referring to an event that took place, again, like death, divorce, um, deportation, um, loss, chronic illness, those are the events that take place. And anxiety is how the trauma manifests. So anxiety would be the um, you know heightened anxiety over maybe things that in the past were a very little deal. Um, they might be more anxious and that might show as um, being forgetful or easily distracted in class. Um, so anxiety is more what you see and the trauma is more of what the actual event was. I also see um, what were the four different types of behavior that were mentioned earlier. Um, so the behavior is labeled into four categories, um, whether it's attention seeking, um, escape behavior, sensory or self-simulatory and tangible. Um, but it's important to note that um, behavior that's due to anxiety is very different than those four specific types of, of behavior. Um, behavior that's, that stems from anxiety um, uh, often, again, like Danielle just mentioned, manifests itself because of a traumatic event that, that occurred. Um, oftentimes, not just because the child is seeking attention or not just because the child needs um, a sensory input. So um, it's important to note that as well. I think the biggest um, thing to think about with the change in behavior would be the word change. Um, if it did not happen prior to the trauma or prior to the big event, um, and it, now it is happening, that would be something to look for. If your child maybe has always, um, you know, been the one in the classroom that maybe makes noises to have kids look and give them that attention, and that's continuing to happen, um, that's not something that we're discussing in, in this webinar. This would be um, trauma that's due or behavior that's due to trauma. So something that's changed in their behavior. Um, I also see that um, some people were asking about the emails being sent afterward with the notes um, and that they've never been received before. Um, we will touch base with the people um, who send out those emails and our marketing team um, to make sure that, that those do go out um, after our session, we're personally not the ones that send those out, but we will um, touch base with somebody afterwards. Um, also another one about the calm down zone um, in your house. So I think that we have one in um, the kindergarten classroom that we showed a picture of, but it's really important that you maybe build this area with your child so they can give some input and they can feel that this is something specific to them that helps them calm down. Maybe reading a book heightens them, but maybe yourself reading a book might calm you down. So they might not want a book in the calm down zone. So you make you wanna make sure that you um, build this area or you build this safe space with your child so they can put their input in. Um, another question, how are children identified for the groups? Um, so basically um, the way Danielle and I um, set it up at JB Lindhurst, um, was we sent out like kind of an info sheet about what rainbows would be all about um, before Christmas time. Um, during Christmas, we kind of went through um, the people who had sent back interest forms um, and we had everybody fill out um, a form just kind of stating the different events that their child has gone through or the different needs they might have. And since this is a new program and, um, and we are just trying it out. We had very little um, kind of resources and things like that. So we wanted the groups to start off small. 
Um, so we tried to pair each group with um, students who were going through similar experiences or um, students that really fit into those specific categories that the curriculum targets. Um, so that's how we were able to kind of choose this this beginning um, the beginning groups and um, and decide which which students would be um, applicants for this this exact time. But we're hoping next year, um, as long as the program continues on, um, we will be able to expand the groups a little bit more and maybe be able to serve a little bit more needs than we were able to this year. I think I see any other questions. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Awesome. Um, thank you guys. Yes. Well, thank you very much um, again for attending the session today. I'm again, we're so sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, this was our first webinar, so um, we weren't too sure about it, but uh, or how the technology behind it would work, but um, we appreciate you all um, bearing with us and um, attending today. I hope you had some takeaways and were able to um, go home with a little bit more knowledge about anxiety stemming from trauma. Um, so always feel free to contact um, all of us here at JB. And um, I think, <laughs> okay. Um, I <laughs> there was supposed to be a slide that showed what the next um, the next webinar series would the next webinar would be in the series. Um, oh, we're moving on. Here's our references. Okay. Um, anyways, there's going to be um, a couple more series in webinars in this series. Um, the next one will be um, featuring our art therapist here at JB Lindhurst. Um, and she'll be talking about art therapy for anxiety. And then um, after that, there'll be also a um, one last webinar on, um, it's focused on a 35 minute breathing and meditation for parents and caregivers. So um, I highly recommend you um, sign up for those. And um, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you guys. All right, bye-bye. Thank you.